And I'm just going to explain to everyone uh, that's listening, participants, that uh, we had thought to divide this next hour into uh, three 20 minute conversations focusing on practical diversity and inclusion related case examples that are homegrown here in Finland. And we hope that you'll find them interesting and insightful, whether an employer or a prospective employee. And um, when, when preparing, we obviously had the thought, do we present all the copious data that exists and research that exists about the power and uh, productivity that comes from diversity and inclusion? And we thought, well, no, this is we're going to assume that our audience today knows a lot of this. And we're going to just drop into chat a couple of links, McKinsey and other links, in case you really want to read into the business case with DNI. Um, mm -hmm. And instead, we would. Um, then similarly, we won't go down the slightly more sad route of the research that shows some of the diverse inclusion issues that foreign talent can face in Finland, particularly regarding name and sometimes race and such. There's also research on that, and we're not uh, pretending that that's not the case. But um, what we're doing instead of today, uh, we hope you agree that it's useful to focus on these practical case studies and um, and we thought we would start with a conversation with Janina Kurki from Sievo. Welcome, Janina. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Okay. And Andrew Kolokolnikov from Mars Global. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for yeah. having me here. Yes, and and um, we have it would be lovely to have a big big conversation with everyone here on the panel. Uh, but we thought that we'd split it so that it's easier to deal with the online dynamics of bigger conversations. So um, Janina and Andrew um right well welcome and um and can you uh, maybe one of you start by describing where your organization is in terms of uh, international talent today would you like to start janina sure i can hi everybody i'm janina kurki um, i work at sievo and the first thing I always hear is like, what, Sievi? It's not the shoe company. It's a procurement analytics software company. So founded in 2003. Uh, from Since day one, I think even the third employee at Sievo was already a person who did not speak Finnish. So from the early days, already seen that the target was the global markets and the business was targeting outside of of Finland. So in that sense, it has always been so that Finnish language was not needed and was not expected. So in a way, we've had the kind of nice situation always to hire the best ones, not the ones that speak Finnish only. Uh, so in that sense, that hasn't been a criteria. It's actually fun that this topic has now risen so high in the areas of subjects, because I think I started in 2017 at Sievo and I was already giving speeches about like, hey, you don't need Finnish. There's opportunities for you in like uh, if you're just talented and you want to do the work. So in that sense, uh, it's kind of really nice to be here talking about it. But that's the background, what I'm talking about, that we have never seen it as a, in a way, issue. We always see the issue that do we find the best talents to do the job? And actually, I think it's more uh, difficult to find people that have certain abilities, but not really because not looking for that certain way to talk Finnish. Mm -hmm. Pick it up from here and sure. Janina for kicking it off. I think everything what you said resonates with me uh, personally and our company a lot. Um, just to give a bit of uh, background information, I'm Andrew. I represent international talent and I represent Mars Global as a head of talent acquisition at Mars Global. Uh, the company itself is a Finnish company. Uh, we are about 100 people uh, scattered across multiple locations. Headquarters is based in Helsinki, but we also have offices in Austria, UK, Japan, uh, Belgium, maybe I forgot some locations, but basically a majority of team members are based in, in Finland. And we are solving the uh, challenge of uh, transportation. Basically, we are providing mobility as a service solution called WIM. Uh, those of you who live in the Helsinki capital area might have used the, the app. It basically helps you to use different transportation modes uh, to navigate from point A to point B. But it doesn't stop there. It also goes onto the global level and uh, our vision implies uh, transportation roaming, 
and also freedom of mobility that can be obtained by owning a car but without owning a car but of course given the corona circumstances right now this is not as actual the kind of international roaming of transportation and so on but it basically implies the global nature of of the company and companies called mass global which stands for mobility as a service global and from day one uh, it has been a global endeavor we have a lot of different investors uh, from different backgrounds and countries it's not only just kind of uh, international aspect but also like different sectors represented because we are on the crossroads of transportation industry that is very old-fashioned if i may say so some transportation companies are like hundreds uh hundred year, years old and then Andrew, we, yep Andrew, we're not going to listen to any more about mass global you have to tell us about international talent <laughs> absolutely yes so what have you learned so, what have you learned about international talent attraction along the way that you could share with an audience because it might be someone listening who's thinking of employing international talent and they're way behind where you are. So have you got any advice to share them on that front? Absolutely, yeah. I was actually going there. I was going there <laughs> that from day one, we were building our uh, pipelines, talent pipelines, in a way that we would be international. So it would represent uh, all the stakeholders we are working with. And we represent uh, also the society in the, in the best way because we need mm -hmm. to um, basically address the uh, needs of uh, people in those locations we, we are launching. Yeah. And then I think it's really important that we understand the local uh, society, we understand the local market, and it goes basically for our domestic market, uh, for Finland. Uh, we have uh, 20 plus different nationalities in, in the company. We have uh, people of various different backgrounds. We speak English, uh, all of us, uh, daily. And um, basically, uh, the nature of, of our work is very international and the team is very international, too. But um, yeah, that's uh, sorry, I kind of rambled away. But um, we, we can get into specific uh, aspects of that. Yeah, well, it's very cool that you work for a company that you love the product that much. And it does sound very exciting. Um, so what I'm hearing from that related to diversity and inclusion is you have a global market, therefore you need to reflect that in your workforce. Absolutely. So it's a sort of business certainty. That sounds like a bit of a strategic decision you made from the top. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was uh, saying. Yeah, yeah. But that yeah, is the, mm. I was just going to add that that is what it is, as, as specifically a strategic decision. It's not something your recruiter will do. Uh, just by meeting an international person oh hey let's get that just because that's the one you need because they are also expecting to have a company that they're welcomed in and that they have colleagues that they would be working with and if that's the first person that's going to get into a 100 person company that no none of them would talk english okay nowadays it's not really happening maybe like none at all but in a way that should not be the recruiter's decision to start that discussion of culture change or in the company, like do that strategic decision of what's the culture language even. So in that sense, I definitely feel that we have also, like uh, Andrew said, uh, 20 nationalities, I'm gonna up, like put it up, we have over 30. And I really feel that when I talk to international people considering coming to Finland, that's one of the questions they're making. Like, do you have other international talents or people that joined you from abroad. And that is actually something that kind of gives us favor that we can say mm. that, yes, we've relocated, relocated people. We've done it this year, actually profoundly. And uh, even during COVID, so in a way, really fortunate. But um, also that you would not be the first one to be a bit like what's going on, how's Finnish things going, and that we already have the knowledge to onboard you as a someone who doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, there, there, there might be someone listening who d will be that 100-person Finnish company looking for their first no, hire. But yeah, luckily, we have um, content today to tell you about the spouse support systems and other systems that you can tap in on and connect your talent to. So you will have an answer. Maybe it's not Janina's answer, which is very positive, but you might have a different one. Like there are these resources, we'll tap you into them. Uh, there's networks, there's spouse support mm -hmm. and so on. And definitely I wouldn't say that if you're already a hundred person company, don't do it. 
that's definitely when mm. you should start doing it. But don't start with the talent and your recruiter. Start with the mm. management and your people, everyone talking about it. How, how's, how's it going to affect your everyday life? What the company needs in the future? What are you guys going to do about it? And how do you uh, feel yourself at ease doing it? And also how are you going to make the newcomers from wherever feel welcomed? So that is the discussion you should definitely have going forward, but not maybe start with the interview of the international talent. Hmm. Andrew, do you um, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually wanted to add also on uh, what Janina said. When you hire your first international hire, that's a little bit uh, like a different story. Uh, it's a new challenge to solve. But then when you already have several internationals in the, in the company, this, this creates certain community. And then it's very kind of easy for people to feel that they belong to this community. I had cases um, in throughout my career when we relocated people from various countries. And then they found lots of friends within the company, but then they struggled finding friends outside the company. And that's where companies can help, actually. Maybe like, you know, when you support people with their like um, free time activities or some hobbies, that's how you get to know like um, things around you. And, and I think uh, for international talent, it's not a problem to connect with other international talent or things within the company, but then going beyond the company and then feeling themselves like part of the society that can be a bit of a bigger challenge. And then when companies decide about hiring their first international person, I think for companies, it's a very kind of um, unclear journey, but it is actually very straightforward. The, once they have uh, made a decision, uh, it's very much the same as hiring anybody, really. And then the uh, nature of the modern recruitment, especially in tech, is so that you have to scrape for talent from all over the world. And uh, you just cannot find everybody you need to find for building successful uh, business in one place. And definitely... Um, Sorry, Emma, if I can jump in. Yeah. I think the perspective of uh, hiring people abroad is, I think in Finland, the discussion is very much like it's difficult, exactly kind of what Andrew said, that it's difficult, there's very much bureaucracy, uh, a lot of paperwork, whatever. I think there's a lot of development happened, let's say, since, for example, 20, 2017, uh, oh. when I started. Like, uh, there has been Enter Finland, uh, uh, development from the government side uh, the process is now we have the specialist process which we can use especially in some of this pro pros with the tech industry and and they quicken the process so i think max of amount of the time amount, maybe two to three months has been the process since we sign it for of course for some it might be even too long but i think even in finland based people have uh, those termination periods of one month at least they might have vacations they want so it's not that swift even let's say moving people in in Finland either so in that sense I wouldn't say it's that difficult of course it requires a lot of pa some paperwork from the candidate because it's individually based process they need to provide the additional information they need to visit consulate and for for that but I think as a company it's pretty easy to provide all the aid and there's a lot of good information provided from the government kind of aiding with that process uh, from the candidate perspective but also the company perspective I could maybe add that things definitely have improved throughout mm. the past 10 years. I'd say looking back, uh, like it was absolutely different. Also, mindset of companies hiring international talent was different. But uh, like uh, with uh, initiatives like International House Helsinki, for example, and different Migri initiatives, I think things are getting better. But uh, I must say that last year I have seen a lot of um, state initiatives uh, hindered by the fact that, for example, there was not enough funding for Migri to process all the applications, yeah, and then it was like very slow. It used to be like pretty fast, one month to process a specialist residence permit application, uh, and then it has become like four months or something. But I would agree that even if you hire kind of domestically, it also implies a long notice period and so a long transition mm -hmm. period as well. Yeah, the, the last session of today is about um, residence, touches on residence permits. And I know that our speaker there is, from the government has been telling me that they've heard loud and clear the industry complaints about the slowness of this residence permit thing and, and a change is underway. 
Um, so we've got we've got at least uh, three, four minutes together now before we move on to the next topic of um, anonymous recruiting. So at this point, um, well, there's, there's a burning question I've got. I'm wondering whether you've got any words for non-tech talent, as it were, um, because I guess I'm I'm one of those, you know, ex-lawyer, et cetera. Uh, when I hear tech talent and these tech initiatives, I think, is this anything to do with people like me? Um, do you have any words of encouragement for international talent that's not tech? Tech yeah. companies provide a lot of other opportunities, but usually it starts from the tech roles. That is true, that the business need you. Uh, the market situation with the employees currently in Helsinki and in Finland makes it so. So it starts probably with the developers, but I think it's uh, they have recognized and realized that actually uh, people outside of Finland understand the stuff and can learn it. So in a way, I would actually encourage people to talk that if you do get involved like understand the system of finland understand the ways of doing in finland it's not about the language always but i think sometimes when people come outside you are seen as an outsider in that sense that you wouldn't understand how things work around here so in a way when i feel that if you can kind of bring that out loud that actually you do know it or you familiar familiarize yourself with it, then you could actually convince the employers that actually we don't need the Finnish language. We need the knowledge of the system. I could maybe add that basically it's all about essentially the value you bring. Mm -hmm. And then as long, it doesn't matter what your background is. And as long as you can bring value and then you do something that companies on the market need, uh, that's not a problem, be it tech industry or any other industry. My personal advice, if you are struggling, uh, you can maybe start working for yourself in a way because Finland is a very transparent place. Uh, it is a very kind of straightforward place. If you work hard, if you provide value, you will achieve success. And then eventually you can sell your services to countries or be employed uh, to companies and be employed by companies. And, uh, that's that's the one of the paths to go. There are many kind of incubator programs and support programs for entrepreneurs and so on and so on. Well. And I think some, what some candidates don't realize that you can always ask, you can always contact the manager and ask like, okay, you said that there would be, or you're assuming that there might be that uh, need of finish, but are you sure there would be that you, I'm like, I couldn't know the work. I, I actually have the experience. I have the knowledge with the tools you're working with, but actually uh, would there be a consideration that if you wouldn't work in Finnish, could that be a possibility? So in that sense, I feel sometimes managers haven't even thought of it. They're like, wow, actually, a good question. Actually, we could do it. I've heard a lot of managers talking about it, but it hasn't come kind of risen up from their side. So in a way, it hasn't been questioned. So and usually teams can actually change their ways of working in sense that if you have very Finnish language based information you need to provide or clients that you need to be working with in Finnish, you can uh, change the client base so that the people that know the language specifically can work with them. And otherwise, you just can provide for the other side, the other stuff and from the for the for example international clients because that is a very uh thing that we're actually promoting that because we have global international clients they appreciate so highly that we have people we have people talking french we have people talking vietnamese we have people talking whatever like different uh languages that they can then work with their own mother mother tongue and they will get betterly understood mm. Thanks both for sharing your thoughts and insights. Um, our, our next uh, little segment is about anonymous recruiting. And I'm noticing that one of our speakers might not be here. Is Juho here? Okay, then we're gonna, we're gonna ad lib and say, Janina, Andrew, Heidi, Laura, have you got, would you like to join a conversation about anonymous recruiting? Um, because I'm, I'm uh, very happy that we do have someone who's totally prepared to talk about that today, which is uh, Christian Thibault from Nordic Diversity Trainers. Welcome, Christian. Okay, while uh, Christian sorts out his audio, I want, um, well, what was Heidi? I saw that you stuck your um, screen on when you uh, heard about anonymous recruiting. And, um, 
I'm, the reason we're thinking of talking about this uh, today was because, well, there's a number of things that um, anonymous recruiting is often spoken about as a way to ensure that you increase your funnel of talent into a, a company. Um, and recently, Espor has announced that it's going to uh, continue its trial of anonymous recruiting, which is something that City of Helsinki has been doing for a longer period. And then um, in my research, I came across uh, the fact that Share Tribe, whose CEO was going to join us and maybe can't after all, um, had experimented with uh, anonymous recruiting. Um, and his experience of it was well I'm not sure if that was helpful or not and um, so I'd be really interested to hear if any of you have thought about using anonymous recruited or, or, or even done it yeah hi um so we have not used it but we have talked about it and I think so I'm I'm Heidi Peck from Futurize and um so, so, so the people that we hire are um, the majority of them is very similar to the profile, I would assume, that Andrew and uh, Janin are also looking for. So tech tech people, and similarly, you don't need to speak Finnish um, at, at Futurize. So, and we have a lot, about a quarter of our people in Helsinki are something else than Finns. Um, yeah, we have talked about the anonymous recruiting, uh, not, not really looked into it, um, but I guess like uh, so far we have not taken steps um, to, uh, towards that uh, further. Um, I think our volumes are such, still on the level that we feel that we are able to um, we are able to really like kind of like uh, look in case by case basis. So um, usually, it, usually our in our case, it's not like we have a position and then we fill it and then then that's done. But we are basically all the time, and I would uh, yeah. <laughs> see yes. from yes. Yeah, so it's like. Okay, you're a full stack developer with uh, these and these languages. We would really like to talk with you, and it's like kind of going on all the time. So it's it's not like you have a you have a position and then you have like a deadline and you have a X number of candidates and you select one person out of those. But it's like a going on. constantly rolling. Exactly. Hmm. Am I heard now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um we're just just hearing that uh, no one here has yet experimented with it because there's this sort of constant rolling building of the talent funnel. Um, kind of could you tell me yeah, Sorry, I was just like kind of what Heidi said that it's definitely the situation with the, let's say, developers that I would say that that's the easy call. We can all say that we don't, we, there, it's definitely because of the market. We, we just say we care about the talent and knowledge of the skills that emphasize the name doesn't sometimes I feel that does anybody even remember the name? We're just talking about full stacks, backends and front ends. So, uh, but actually, uh, in that sense, I feel that it is a it is a matter that we also are discussing. I I hope everybody is, but uh, that where the differences come from, let's say top level management uh, positions, and especially I would say some kind of more uh, strategic wide decision making. Uh, we have had CFO. Uh, process for example this year was not finland based person but uh who got chosen but of course they did actually have experience with the finnish system and let's say uh the taxation issues and what do you have in for finance so my example was just showing that it's like i kind of said already that it's more about the skills that you can provide that if you need some way of knowledge of the ways of working in that certain country that is what you should be as a candidate emphasizing and the anonymous part i think we have a very specific way of doing cvs and cover letters in finland so i i've sometimes been wondering that i could actually probably recognize just the way people do their cvs <laughs> so in a way you do, wouldn't need the name but you could see from certain aspects like is it let's say at least close by 
a person. You know the typical school backgrounds that you're expecting for people to have. For example, you're expecting them to go on to specific, I don't know, clubs or whatever. You have the experience. So already the diversity starts from very much for somewhere else than just from the name. Mm. Sorry, Christian. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, put your headset back on. I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear you. Headset. Put it back on, your little white jobbies that you had. Yeah. Hmm. No, no, he lost. Oh no, what did say? But um, yeah, so diversity. Yeah. But just thinking, standing back from your system, so you're focusing on, so language is relevant to you, the experience front stack, but not stack uh, is relevant to you. But at the end of the day, do you ever step back and say, okay, so if we look at the demographics of who we've got on board, everyone is white or something like that. Do you, do you ever look at diversity in other ways, can you tell us about that, anyone? We are. We have defined our diversity goals, and we are, uh, and we have set ourselves to increase the um, or improve our gender balance in our tech um, tech competence, which is the, the most of our people are belonging to that. So mostly developers. So we want to, in other words, we want to hire more uh, women, and that is something mm -hmm. that we are looking at. And then there's like things such as um some some women uh, who work as developers their their path how they have ended up in their role is not necessarily the traditional uh path how how we're used to seeing kind of people becoming developers so they may not have gone to the uh technical university and then they for like through summer jobs and uh from there getting their first first uh, um full time roles etc they might have uh, changed their careers and so on so i think for example, like looking at that type of diversity, then what we have learned is that we need to we need to be able to look beyond that. It's not that you need to have a degree from a um, certain uh, study field or even certain school, but you need to kind of like be able to kind of open your eyes more widely and and also be aware of those biases that you might might have yourself towards that um, that people all the good developers should have a. I don't know, a CS degree or something like that. So uh, I think it's, um, for, for us at least, the, the discussion has been on this type of, um, this type of issues. Very good. So, uh, I just want no, just going to say focusing on gender um, and academics. I, I don't want to stop you speaking. I would like to go back to other diversity um, measures other than gender as well. Mm -hmm. Andrew, yeah, so. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Heidi said about overall looking at school and background of the candidate. I think the most efficient way to be unbiased is to uh, give small assignments to candidates throughout the process. And it can be not necessarily like the developer position, it can be any position, because that's the best way you can evaluate how it is to work with the person. And that's what you basically care about in the first place, that this person uh, can do the job and can do the job well and work with the team. And that's uh, basically the most unbiased uh, way to evaluate the candidate. I think, and we usually strive to give assignments for pretty much any role that we are hiring for. And it doesn't matter if they went to school or maybe they self self learned everything. Yeah, we do the same, but it's like, do you take the person to an interview or not? So I think that yeah. they're kind of looking at the background, yeah. and then also in the assignments or whatever you do, like kind of they're kind of taking into account that it might be that men in general are more confident, they have more experience, they have had more interviews, they have possibly more like they are just more confident as techies so they're taking that also into account that that might impact their, their performance uh, that they give so it's yeah hello yes no, I, I think you now you can hear me yes we can't see you but i can hear you oh wow <laughs> anyway go on go on christian okay i can't see myself so um i don't know That's what good. the problem is then but anyway thanks i have to apologize mm -hmm. for the technical problems we tested this and it did work so 
Um, I, I hear about uh, uh, the tasks and I hear um, many things that I, I would have brought up. Um, uh, and uh, considering the tasks, uh, it makes me think of my colleague who is now um, uh, due to uh, COVID in India with a very restricted um, internet access, uh, poor possibilities to to get her equipment fixed or to get additional equipment and so on. So um, if there is a task prior to the invitation to the interview, um, not everybody is at the same starting point. Uh, and I don't mean that from the point of view of uh, social justice or whatever. I mean it from the point, from your point of view. You want to have the best, and for sure, once you employ the person, you will pr provide with, you know, uh, the proper access, and you know, the person will move to your location probably. So um, also there, uh, we have to be aware of the different. Uh, starting points, and I think it was uh, Heidi who said, uh, "Is it Heidi or Heidi?" I'm, I'm German, so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Heidi, Heidi said about um, uh, uh, you spoke about the uh, yeah, you would recognize who is who, and and that is actually one of the reasons why uh, anonymous recruiting often does not work. Uh, because if you have not prepared a middle management, like Andrew said, you have to have the discussion before you employ international talent. Or was it Janina who said that? Mm -hmm. So, so um, if middle management is not happy with your top-to-down new ideas and measures, they will actually make a sport out of it to recognize and read between the lines and then move those applications to bottom of the pile or and that is researched um uh, uh, knowledge that is just a fact uh, I, I don't mean like maybe for your company specifically but you know on the on the statistical basis uh, uh, so so the the anonymous recruiting from our findings the only good thing about it is that you actually do encourage international talent to apply in the first place because they believe now here we have a chance. But then there's a lot of things that happen before that and after that, that uh, actually doesn't give very good results if they're not taken care of. Um, there is uh, research in a, a large, large scale research um, uh, from France, but re the research has taken place in several European countries where actually after, um, after five years you have less diversity in your company and your leadership and where also there has only be slight improvements in the first um, uh, uh, employments regarding women but not um, ethnical diversity at all and even the the, the part of the increase in, in uh, regarding gender diversity was very small and didn't you, um, I think you mentioned um, to me at one point that the research shows that anonymous recruiting may increase your, the diversity of your funnel at application stage and hiring stage, but then three years down the line, not so much. Yes, yes. Uh, there is, uh, um, there is uh, Caramella 2018, Dobin and Kalev 2018. Uh, who have researched this, and then there is also several different uh, European programs. So uh, this is rather recent. The the the, the research part or the re the results of the research um, since 2018, uh, since this program has or anonymous recruiting has not been practiced for so long, but at this point we actually have results, and we do know that um, it's it's in it. Uh, like in a, as an isolated measure, uh, there are many uh, traps connected to it, and it is also not sufficient. Uh, if the target is um, to increase diversity in your um, company, and uh, the um, 
and 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 I heard about the the the, the bias the bias point of view, and I hear that from clients as well, um, like um, being scared of having a bias one way or the other. But um, the way we see it, if you don't, if you're not actually actively go out looking for diversity, you're not going to have it. So just being non-biased and neutral and fair, in <laughs> quote unquote fair, I think it's not enough. Mm. And uh, so all all this that also has been discussed in the previous session, what Andrew said, uh, look at your environment. And I would go even further uh, um, when we speak about the onboarding of family and, and spouses. Um, I know for entrepreneurs, it's always a bit touchy, risky to involve with politics, but look at the municipal politics, uh, where you are located. Um, find ways to also promote uh, local initiatives, um, change the community around you so that the, the, the onboarding will be supported by, that, by the surroundings and the international um, reputation of your surroundings. So even if, even if you inside your house have everything in order, but if the, the you know, <laughs> the municipality around you or the region around you is not, not playing along, it's still going to be difficult. Yeah, that's um, good to bring in the, the bigger system here. We have yeah. been concentrating more on the yes. corporate microcosms. Yes. Um, so that's... And that's the risk with anonymous recruiting because it's many times seen as decure. Mm -hmm. So um, but that's what I strongly, if, if I have a message to give out is say, yes, it will help you to get more applications in from diverse candidates, but please don't rest on anonymous recruiting alone. Yeah, I, I totally feel that uh, I've seen the cases, in, let's say, in my network that when you, when, when you have the policies of diversity maybe in place and you have those great speeches, let's say, I think sometimes it ends there. It's like, isn't that the starting point, actually, or should be the starting right. point of doing it? And uh, Christian, I think you had excellent points. What I and what I was actually thinking also is about that. How do you bring diversity in recruitment is actually ha having a diverse process also, or the kind of the ability of the process providing diverse ways of doing. So it, what it means that you have those uh, assignments, for example, but they need to also be different ones. You should have several people involved in the process, not just like one recruiting manager throughout or one even HR person doing the screening or whatever you want to do with it. So involve people. I, I'm also the first one to say that usually people are the like, uh, loosest end of the process in a way that if it doesn't maintain, but of course I do value, for example, I, I train our, our people with the bias factor and with the, about intuition, for example, but I'm also like, that's the part I'm worried about and that's why I'm doing it because that is one of the uh, angles that we need to keep in, well, maintain in, in, a, in our eyesight and remember that it's about us, but we need to provide with the like from the process already to provide that d diversity and diverse ways. Sure. I'm so happy that Laura has joined us. Will, will you present yourself and join the conversation? Okay. I was loving this. I was listening to you all here in the background as I was, you know, unabashedly eating my breakfast and such. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it was one of these things where I had to say, I appreciate all these impressions that you all have. I, I come from a slightly different angle from you all, I think. Um, I am actually more of a consultant and researcher in this space. And, and I love what Christian was saying. I definitely kind of wanted to like echo some of this. Um, but one thing that I definitely want to say was that uh, for me, my experience has been both as an employee in the Finnish market and surprise, surprise, I'm not Finnish, you know, so it is possible to get jobs in this area. It's possible to have like, a career here and such um, without being a traditional Finn and such. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've been working as a comms and organizational development uh, consultant in Finland uh, for a while now, a couple of years, actually. 
And in conjunction with that, as well as um, with an MBA researcher, um, I've actually had a chance to really look at 28 companies in this region. And um, in that, I was largely looking at how companies scale um, and how they grow internally to support their targeted growth and goals externally. And for that, inclusion just kept coming up. Um, so for me, it's been a matter of looking at inclusion from a very practical standpoint. Um, thinking about inclusion not just because it's the morally good thing to do or just because, you know, you want to have, you know, better looking pictures on your employer brand website, this kind of thing. Um, I've heard companies say all kinds of things, trust me. Um, but inclusion as a practical thing, um, so not just the words of it, not just presence, um, but processes and actions that have an impact. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing I look at when I, when I talk about inclusion in that sense. Hmm. It'd be great to actually dig a bit into these processes, mm -hmm. um, Yanina. You know, every, everyone's picked up on them. That, um, but let's step for a moment into the shoes of someone who's listening to this, who's looking maybe, maybe they're in recruitment or they're leading a finished company mm -hmm. and they're looking at their workforce and they're beginning to realize that maybe it's a bit homogenous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and they're beginning to be curious, you know, maybe why is that? How, what is the process? Does my recruiter speak English? Do they have cultural awareness? What do our job adverts look like? What are the faces on our website? What are the mini signals we're sending? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this person is our audience right mm -hmm. now. Let's imagine them. What can we say to them that's helpful, practical, useful? Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I would say there are a number of things, but understand we're looking at inclusion, as Christian was saying, is not just about getting the people in. Um, if you're a recruiter, that's one thing, and that's a beautiful thing. And, and I love, yeah, you know, she was saying things about, you know, you have to think about diversity in the process as well. That was beautiful. Um, but I want you to think about what happens after you get them in, okay? Um, and that's an important thing because for me, when I look at inclusion, a lot of the metrics I look at are proxy metrics. I look at things like retention and empowerment, okay? And those are things that it's not just your recruiter you have to think about for that. I mean, you need a lot of people on board. You need your HR on board, you need your managers on board, you need your, you know, everybody in your teams to a certain degree. It has to be owned throughout. Um, but there are some things that you can do. Onboarding is significant. That is one of the most statistically significant things that are going to predict how people can, are, if they're going to be there at the one-year mark, three-year mark, and five-year mark. Um, is their standard. So, um, making certain that from the very beginning, you're boosting a couple things. I want you to think about clarity. It needs to be very clear who you are, what you're doing, what everybody, you know, understanding the different kind of roles people have, understanding what people are joining. Okay, because what happens a lot of time is organic exclusion. Nobody means to be a horrible company. No one means to be that, right? Um, but things can happen if you don't think things through or you just kind of let things develop and, you know, eventually everybody's gonna know everything, right? That kind of, that, that feeling is what oftentimes prevents people from getting information they need to be empowered. It prevents people from, you know, understanding systems that were built by people that are not like them which is often the case if you're joining from a different background and such. Um, so make certain people have a way to get in. They understand where things and critical things are for their job, um, who to connect with about different things, the kind of the relationships and dynamics in your company. Um, communication is, a, is actually code, you know, significant um, with this. So the two most important things are clarity and communication. Um, so make certain that your information management and information flow um, is something that includes people. So a lot of folks don't spend enough time thinking about internal communications in their company. Um, that is one of the statistically most significant predictors of whether or not you can retain people who are from different diverse backgrounds, okay? And so I want you to really think about that because what happens if you just have your organic flow a lot of times, people don't think about this, but you know, you're going to talk to your friends. You're going to share information, especially as you grow. If you might have a network of people that you're really close with 
And oftentimes in Finland, the starting companies are, you know, pretty homogenous in, you know, that, that initial core. It might be two or three levels of hires later before they start diversifying. So what happens is that initial core of people, they have really strong relationships, strong ties. Information circulates much more there. If you look at the, the information flow between there, it's a magnitude sometimes of three to four times that is what it flows outside. Okay. So people who kind of get hired later have lesser access to a casual conversation, lesser access to things like idea generation. You know, if you have new projects, new concepts you're tossing around, well, sometimes you have to think about when do you start sharing that externally? You know, take it out of the sauna and take it to the public space, you know, with other people from the company. Information management, information, information flow is a big thing. Um, think about in terms of the time of communication. A lot of folks use Slack and things like this, right? Um, if you have an international organization, you have multiple time zones, it's very, very hard to keep track of everything all the time, right? It's even harder if you have commitments at home, like children, things like this, okay? Um, so not thinking about or having policies about or plans to catch people up, these are things that unfortunately disadvantage certain groups more than others, okay? Um, think about your decision-making processes. Make that as clear and transparent as possible. Um, the more vagueness you have in that area about how things get greenlit or different kind of things like this, the easier it is for unintentional kind of discrimination and biases to creep in there and create an exclusionary context, okay? So be very clear about how decision-making works. Foster relationships and internal networks in your company. That's another thing you can do, okay? Um, think about how can you build those connections between people who are more influential and established in the company and the newer people who often tend to be more diverse um, in terms of their backgrounds, okay? Mm. Yeah. So can I just say one example of that, um, an organization I've worked in, some of the more powerful people, uh, longstanding, high rank, they used to say, uh, just send out invitations to randomly picked chunks of people and say, I'm going to be at breakfast at this time, join me if you want. Perfect. And that's how you could do it. And everyone got these invites. Yeah. Anyway, that's sorry. beautiful. Sorry. I love that. That is an absolute great thing to do. Here's something I like to encourage people um, or companies to do. Have mentoring with the people who are the most influential, but have it where they're being mentored, okay, by some of the newer people. Because one of the things that happens is oftentimes there's an informal hierarchy of respect and status. And what can happen is people who had a long time to prove their worth and prove their value in the company they're more likely to be the people people will run ideas by and opportunities by, okay? So give other people a chance to prove themselves. Give other people a chance to be the authority, to be the expert, to be the people who are spotlighted for what they're doing. And make certain that they their value is known to people who are even more influential or established in the company. So the reverse mentoring in that sense. Um, and that should be possible to pull off because if you hire anyone in your company, they should be competent in something, right? So there is something that they can talk about. There's something that they can be able to share and be able to demonstrate that they have some kind of expertise. Um, so I would say clarity, communication, decision-making, um, relationship and internal network building and respect and status um, hierarchies and versions. Those are things that are the, some of the most impactful things that you can do in the company. But to say also, um, those are things that you can do both at the company level and the individual level. And that is something I want to make certain everyone knows. Um, it doesn't just have to be at the C-suite and the managers thinking about inclusion development and how you get people in the company and keep people in a company uh, from different backgrounds. That is something that anyone in your organization has the power and the ability to be able to do, to boost, to be able to honestly uh, grow that in your organization. So I want you to think about that. It's not just about um, what the corporate speech is. This is about on the ground options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for example, I'm just thinking 
about what you're saying about the flow of information and power structures mm -hmm. that whatever your role in a company if a newbie comes you'll be able to connect them with someone yeah you can be able to do that um, too. Just introduce them to someone, introduce them to a lunch or a coffee and, and it help them increase their networks. And it's, mm -hmm. You know, I never thought of it really in terms of power distribution, but I guess there is an angle yeah. to it. Like Especially that. in companies in Finland, which are more likely to have at least a stated value of egalitarianism or equality with people. I think that's a big thing. Uh, I think Finns really embrace this idea that people are more or less equal. You're more likely to have companies that are flat or network organizations here. Um, and in those companies, it's really, really important that you pay attention to power dynamics. You pay attention to communication dynamics. You pay attention to status. Those are your more insightful proxies for inclusion um, in flat organizations or network organizations that you might want to look at. Can I just, um, this is, that's triggered a thought for me around naming and celebrating difference. Mm -hmm. So in conversations I've had in Finland, I've, I've noticed a general distaste mm -hmm. for pointing out difference or somehow recognizing that someone is different in some mm -hmm. way. Um, and, and, and yet I've had other experiences where recognizing difference has been very much appreciated. So what do anyone want to comment it's on this? It's a Finnish way of avoiding conflict at any cost. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's potential of uh, like saying something wrong, you don't do it. <laughs> so, sorry, as a Finn, I can totally relate in a way. Uh, conflict? Well, ah. yeah, it's... Um, it's it's this uh, it's the old discussion about equity and equality and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and and if you if you if you don't see a difference then you don't see the complete person either so yes. <laughs> yeah. and and the story of the person and and, and so um, mm -hmm. I, I I think there's a lot of discussion to be had in the future and um, I, I, I I wanted to to relate to to Laura. Uh, uh, actually, um, the mentoring part um, from all of the different measures you can take and the combined measures you can take, mm -hmm. it's actually the most like powerful. Um, there, there's a, uh, to relate, for example, a volunteer um, diversity training program in the organization uh, will give you a gain of diversity of 9%. Mm -hmm. A mentoring uh, program where you would also circulate through different parts of the organization mm -hmm. uh, gives you thirty percent. This was the the top marker in, mm -hmm. on on a three year basis. Yeah. You know, like three year when we talk about uh, diversity recruitment, that's already long term nowadays. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. we don't have the experience for such a long time. Diversity mm. as a as a human resource factor has only been discussed since the 1990s, and then it was only first ten years. It was only uh, about gender. Yeah. So so uh, and actually the the discussion in the 90s was more about how do, so since we have to accept gender diversity, how do we make it happen in such a way that it doesn't hurt us? That was. Mm. Ten years of the, of the diversity discussion. I'm glad we've grown from that a little bit. Yeah, well, we eventually learned that, and that is the title of this um, session: uh, Why does inclusion and diversity make sense for the business? And we should always remind that diversity is the winner and is the competitive advantage. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, even though we now here go into details and into what might appear ch as challenges to people who are listening. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the the business advantage of diversity is 30% also, 33% actually, and mm -hmm. repeatedly uh, researched um, by now also. So uh, there's a lot of leverage here for mm -hmm. taking a few small extra measures, <laughs> and, exactly. and 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 then those and and those include equity measures, and um, <clears throat> and and all what. Um, Laura said from the onboarding on, 
I have a very, very short three sentence story when I was joining a Finnish football team mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. Uh, they asked me to come to the to their trainings. Mm -hmm. And it was the winter period, so they didn't have games. So it, during the trainings, they played games. So the first time I went there, um, I scored 60% of the goals. Mm -hmm. Like we scored like nine goals and I scored six of them. And uh, nobody spoke to me, not before, not after. I went there the next time. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. maybe I was too selfish the last time and they didn't like that. So mm -hmm. now I just support the goals. Mm -hmm. And I did that and they made a lot of goals. And again, nothing. Nobody spoke to me. I went home. Then I went for the third time. I think I thought this is the last time I go there. They don't like me. Mm -hmm. Somebody mm -hmm. came with a bill, an invoice mm -hmm. to pay my membership. That was my welcome. Oh. So the Finnish welcome is very warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and, and you know, like and this is, I mean, we embrace the differences, but we should also be aware of our differences. And <laughs> this is somehow, you know, like I have this because I, I'm, 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 this is not a, is a stereotype in a way, but I've heard that from many of my uh, international. Uh, friends and contacts, similar stories. They arrived in Finland by airplane on the Friday evening. Mm -hmm. uh, all they had was an address. They had an mm -hmm. apartment uh, mm -hmm. or maybe a hotel. Then they had a hotel address or an apartment address. When they had an apartment, they came to the apartment to an empty fridge. Mm -hmm. And then one day they found their way to the to the organization where they were supposed to, you know, on board. And then that was the first contact. So, so it's, uh, yeah, I think what I'm hearing, we've only got about a minute left here, but what I think what I'm hearing here is, uh, an encouragement to be human and to think about people's emotional experience. And actually we're all human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and we can all see how we'd benefit from and enjoy those that paying attention. Yeah. Actually, I definitely agree with that. Um, for communication, one of the things that was the most important things in that area was having one-to-one -one conversations with people. Um, when people felt that they were seen and their issues and thoughts were acknowledged as individuals, that made them feel more included. So, I mean, the human aspect is the most important thing because overall, you're not recruiting people who have different demographics, you're not recruiting people from different backgrounds, you're recruiting people. And that is an important thing to understand. So you, um, keep the human element in mind as, you know, in terms of how you're addressing that, how you're building systems and processes. Mm -hmm. I think, Heidi, you even include that in your uh, your functions title, don't you? It's not it's not HR. Yeah, it's HC, it, it, human care. Mm -hmm. Human care. Yeah, human care. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so. Good. Well, um, we're, we're actually, we've run up against the clock, I'm afraid. Um, so I know you wanted to say something, Christian, but I'm going to respect the timetable yeah. and, and the fact that um, in the break, there's going to be a uh, video that if anyone wants to watch, they need to add break to their agenda. Mm -hmm. And it'll be about uh, financial support, workplace, Finnish and Swedish. <laughs> Before we go there, I just want to thank our dear panelists, every one of you. Thank you for coming to join us today and for sharing your thoughts and, and insights. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.